Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Shoals Marine Labs weekly marine science seminar. I'm Jennifer Seavey, the executive director at Shoals. And for all of you who are not familiar with us, Shoals is the largest and the oldest undergraduate focused marine lab in the country and is jointly operated by UNH and Cornell. We're located in the Isles of Shoals, about 10 miles offshore of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Every summer on the island, we offer our students that are in courses and in our research programs and the entire island community these weekly rock talks. That's what we call these marine science seminars on our rocky island. And this year, we're bringing them to you off the island, sharing them more broadly to help spread knowledge about our precious oceans. So tonight, our format is a 45-minute talk, followed by 15 minutes of questions and answers. If you want to ask a question, you can use the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen. You just click on there, and you can type in your question, and I'll read them to Owen. If you need any technical help during any of this, you can also put your questions in Q&A, and we'll help you out. So without further delay, Owen Nichols is our speaker tonight. We're very excited to have him. He is the Director of Marine Fisheries Research at the Center for Coastal Studies in Provincetown, Massachusetts, where he conducts research on, on collaboration with um, fishermen and shellfish farmers. I want to give a special thanks to all the hard work and commitment for all of those folks at the Center for Coastal Studies their mission is to understand and protect coastal environment and marine ecosystems. Owen's research is really focused in fisheries, oceanography, marine mammal and fisheries interactions and ecosystem based fisheries management. He is a PhD candidate at the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth in their School for Marine Science and Technology. He's also a guest investigator at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. He is adjunct professor at the Massachusetts Maritime Academy. And in a role that we are very grateful for, Owen teaches a course at Shoals Marine Lab called Sustainable Fisheries. Tonight, he's gonna to talk about that topic and his talk is entitled Community-Based Collaborative Fisheries Research, Fishermen and Scientists Working Together. So I'm gonna turn it over to Owen now. Wonderful. Um, hoping everyone can hear me. Um, Jennifer, thank you very much for that introduction. And um, I'm growing accustomed to giving uh, Zoom presentations from the uh, comfort of my spare bedroom, which has become a makeshift home office here. So please forgive the pile of papers on the, the bed behind me. Um, yeah, you know, I think Jen, I, I appreciate that introduction. You know, I'll, I'll get right into the meat of the talk here. I, I do want to say, you know, I, I grew up in a, in a fishing community. I'm a very proud Cape Cod native, um, you know, and it's a real joy every day to work alongside members of our community. And, you know, right now, um, you know, we're all struggling in a variety of different ways to cope with uh, the pandemic and then um, a lot of other things these days. But in particular, you know, our, our seafood, the folks who put food and particular seafood on the table have been really trying to find creative ways to adapt um, to the pandemic and to COVID-19. Um, we might get into that a little bit later on if we have time. Um, we'll talk about that in the context of working together and um, doing field work briefly. But it's, you know, now more than ever a real pleasure to work with the community. And I've had a little bit of an opportunity to do that through Shoals up uh, your way as well. So um, anyways, I'm going to go ahead and share my slides. Um, I haven't gotten any notifications that it's not working. So I'm going to go ahead and put my slides up here. And hopefully folks can see those. And um, I'll stand by for any messages that that's not working. Um, and if there's any uh, technical difficulties, if the slides aren't coming through fast enough or anything, uh, please make sure to let, let them know. And they'll let me know. Um, Jen already introduced the name of this talk, um, you know, and it really is very much about working together. And I am going to talk a little bit about science today, but I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about how the, the sort of the practice of how we get to do science and some of the outreach and engagement. You know, it's 
it's a unique thing that we do working with the fishing community. It's not like a lot of other kinds of science. It's a very, very human dimension to it all. Um, so I imagine many of you are familiar, um, you know, Cape Cod, the name Cape Cod, of course, um, named after that symbolic fish. It's our, you know, it's the logo that you see in the state house. Uh, in Massachusetts, you know, Cape Cod is very well known for its fishing grounds, very long history of fishing all around the productive waters around Cape Cod. Um, you know, as far back as recorded history goes out here in the Cape, um, we have an enormous amount of historic knowledge, culture associated with our fishing community. And, you know, today's fisheries on the Cape are pretty unique. You know, they're small scale. This is, you know, actually fairly comparable to what you might see up in New Hampshire as well. Um, you know, they're mostly day boat fisheries. They're boats that generally go out for not much longer than a day or two at a time. Um, the great thing if you're a seafood consumer is that that means really fresh catch coming back. Uh, so that's a good thing to have. Um, and, you know, for for those of us who, who are, are in the market for good seafood, you know, the, you have a unique opportunity now to actually buy seafood off the boat um, or as direct as you can from fishermen. That's happening in New Hampshire. That's happening out on Cape Cod. And again, maybe I'll touch on that a little bit more later, but I just want to put in a plug for, you know, now being the, uh, you know, no, there's no better time than now to get in touch with your local fishermen, make that connection. You might have to do it at a six foot distance, but you can make that connection, buy seafood directly from your fishermen. Uh, from your local fishmongers and ask the kinds of questions you might want to ask with regard to seafood sustainability and things like that. But that said, all of these small scale sort of owner operator day boat fisheries and small scale fisheries, you know, they don't necessarily fit terribly well sometimes into the regulatory framework that we have. And, you know, these small scale fisher, fisheries operations need to be able to to get information to fisheries managers quickly. They need to be able to adapt and evolve as both the environment changes and the regulatory environment changes. And so a lot of our science is really focused on helping the fishing community, helping fishermen get answers to questions that they need or help fisheries managers get answers to questions that they need. And so a lot of the work that I do through the center and through the fisheries research program is really, I mean, we're doing science, but it's also very much about fostering collaboration and understanding, building community, building trust. Um, you know, we do science, but a lot of times to do a little bit of science, you have to do a lot of outreach and engagement first. And I'll touch a little bit on that process. And, you know, right now we're really focusing on issues very relevant to local fishermen out here on the Cape. And I think you could find some of these same issues in communities up in Maine and New Hampshire. And I think in many cases, these are worldwide issues and questions that we have just in different fisheries and different formats. You know, a lot of times that conversation starts by, you know, asking either fishermen or, or fisheries managers, you know, what do you need to know that you currently don't know? How can we work together? And that's the most important part to get that information to who needs it. And again, a lot of outreach and engagement. It's a, it's, a big part of the job. It's sometimes very challenging because it takes a long time to make sure we're asking the right questions, to build that trust, to build that engagement. And I'll talk very briefly about the process and then I'll get into a couple of case studies of the science that we do. Um, you know, a lot of the time I spend talking to fishermen, you know, I think my boss thinks that's what I do pretty much all the time. And he thinks I do it mostly in bars. The reality is, is if I'm in, a, in an environment, uh, in a commercial establishment, it's usually a coffee shop. And uh, fishermen generally drink a lot of coffee and there's a few places open early enough out here to talk to fishermen. Um, but really I spend a lot of time down at the dock, you know, again, engaging, talking to fishermen, checking in, you know, sort of flying the flag and, you know, driving the truck down the dock, um, you know, getting out and talking to folks, making sure if they have questions, you know, a lot of these folks in the fishing community, you know, I mean, some of them do email and things like that, but they don't necessarily communicate the way we do and they don't have time at the end of the day to compose a thoughtful email, you know. Um, so the best way to, to, to really interact with people is to make yourself available to be present. Um, you know, a lot of those conversations happen at the dock and you'll see, you'll see coffee cups a lot in these photographs, but you know, um, I was just down the dock with uh, Ernie Eldridge who's shown here in this photograph this morning. Um, we're doing a variety of different research projects. Uh, we've been working together 13 years studying environmental effects on squid distribution. 
And today we've been uh, working on a study of uh, interactions between seals and fishing gear. And, you know, a lot of times you, you have a laugh, you have a good conversation, you work together to develop sound scientific hypotheses based on the questions that we have that are shared. I go fishing a lot. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time going out on boats and, you know, doing my best to do what they do, learning, learning how the gear works. It's a, if it's a fishery I haven't worked in, I'm not going to make any assumptions based on books. I'm going to get out there. I'm going to get out and see it. I'm going to be part of it if I can. I'm reasonably capable on deck of most fishing boats. So I try to get out there and learn and listen. Um, you know, you do a lot of listening. Always coffee. Not enough coffee. Um, every once in a while, you're stuck in a meeting somewhere. You know, unfortunately, a lot of that outreach and engagement happens in meetings as well. And uh, unfortunately, in this case, one of our local newspaper photographers uh, captured me falling asleep during a New England Fishery Management Council meeting. So again, sometimes there's not enough coffee. Um, but a lot of times these meetings, and in particular, the hallways outside the meeting rooms and the after hours gatherings, um, you know, that's where a lot of the work gets done. You know, we figure out ways to answer questions together. But again, there's a lot of time spent doing outreach and engagement with the community in as many different ways as you can. Um, sometimes that outreach happens in the living room. And I, again, I throw this picture up mostly just as a nod again to Ernie Eldridge, uh, the patriarch of this fishing family that I work with in Chatham. Um, my PhD work and my master's work for that matter was born in Ernie's living room. And here we are celebrating his birthday uh, a few years back um, while we were attending a conference in New Orleans um, for uh, uh, sustainable seafood. And there's a, a couple of other academics as well as some fishermen in this photograph. But anyways, um, I wanted to talk mostly about science. We've talked a little bit about how we get to science and I'm gonna move through some case studies here, um, talk a little bit about the work that we do. But um, you know, I do wanna point out field work has changed a little bit um, in our current climate of uh, COVID-19. You know, this is a pretty typical thing you might see of uh, me working with one of my uh, humble research assistants on deck, um, in this case doing some derelict fishing gear research. And I'll talk about that more at the end if I have time. Um, you know, collecting data and that lobster actually broke my pencil right after that photograph was taken, but looks a little bit different these days with social distancing and all the protocols we have uh, in place on the boat. And there's uh, me with a much smaller research assistant and proper face covering. Um, you know, so it is a little bit different these days. You know, field work is a challenge. Outreach is a challenge. You know, that talking to fishermen part that's so important is a little bit more challenging these days. You know, it's hard to recognize one another down the pier when we're all wearing masks. Um, it is a challenge, but we're getting it done. Um, you know, again, we could talk about that more later. But I do want to get into some case studies here, talk a little bit about some of the research projects we do and the different type of work that we do. Um, you know, first of all, you know, we do a really wide range of different kinds of projects. And this one is a um, kind of a collaborative multidisciplinary study. I'm going to focus on the fisheries component of it. But out, out on Cape Cod on the eastern shore of the Cape, there's this really fascinating, really dynamic coastal lagoon system. Um, Pleasant Bay um, has shoreline of uh, four different towns. It's dynamic in the sense that it's constantly changing. There's a barrier beach system that separates it from the Atlantic that's constantly shifting and changing. And it has a really long history of shellfish harvest, finfish harvest, and you know, today the, it's a lot different than it used to be, and that's a pretty typical thing to hear from fishermen. Um, there are some natural resource management authorities at various scales from municipal on up that um, work to manage resources in the bay. And, you know, one of the things that have been noted is that since the last time a full inventory, a full survey of fisheries resources was done in the system, a lot has changed. Mass Division of Marine Fisheries worked out here in the 1960s. Um, more recently, the Pleasant Bay Alliance, which is a management body that um, dictates a lot of the local management of the system, um, recommended that we really need to do a full inventory of what's out there um, and develop a long-term monitoring program. So for us, in order to do that, at least with respect to fisheries resources, you know, the first thing we did is we started to reach out to the fishing community, to local shellfish constables and resource managers, but especially to the fishing community. And this is a pretty good example of what that looks like. Um, a group called the Friends of Pleasant Bay commissioned a pilot study where we went out 
and talked to a few folks and figured out where to look for juvenile lobsters in Pleasant Bay. And that's what's happening at the bottom left of your screen there. Uh, that's a fisherman showing me on a nautical chart on my laptop where he'd been seeing uh, little tiny young of the year lobsters. They call them crickets, really tiny little uh, juvenile lobsters. And so we worked with the fishing community to design some surveys um, that would both replicate some of the work that was done in the 1960s, but also yield really useful data. And in many cases, we adopted either commercial fishing gear or we used um, a collaboration with local fishermen and their local knowledge to inform how we do our surveys. And so again, a couple of photographs here, you know, pictures, pictures tell a thousand words or um, whatever the analogy is there. But, you know, really involving the fishermen through the whole process. And at lower left, um, that's Ted Lucas. He's a commercial fisherman from Chatham, Massachusetts. He's operating one of our research boats and his skill was invaluable to uh, doing our trawl and dredge surveys. And when we needed a bigger boat um, and a, a more dedicated survey, uh, bottom right, that's uh, Chris Viprino, a fisherman from Orleans. Um, who brought his boat into Pleasant Bay for us to work with. And we did a specialized dredge survey for quahogs. And again, using that local knowledge is really important, but also having fishermen involved helps us communicate what we're doing and helps us further engage stakeholders. You know, both of these fishermen are well known and well respected in their communities. And when they go talk to fishermen about the work that they're involved in, it lends, first of all, another element of transparency, but also credibility to the fishing community. Um, so it was really, really helpful. And this is one of these projects where it was just really visible too. You know, we were on the intertidal a lot, uh, uh, doing intertidal shellfish sampling, and there's lots of commercial harvesters out there. You know, generally first they just wanted to laugh at us for our scientific sampling methods uh, as they compare to the proper way to actually dig steamer clams. Um, but again, you know, that after, after that little bit of a laugh, you know, it's a great venue to actually have real conversation about the science we're doing. So continued outreach and engagement, really, really valuable. And this project is one of many that we do, uh, but this one really is pretty unique because it, it engaged the fishing community, but also the broader community. It generated an enormous amount of data, um, setting a baseline for future monitoring work. And it also generated a whole new level of stewardship uh, on the behalf of the broader community, but also the fishing community. Bottom right, that's a bunch of folks um, inside what we call the floating classroom. It's a, a catamaran solar powered research vessel uh, put together by the Friends of Pleasant Bay and operated out of Pleasant Bay Community Boating. Um, and that boat, even though it's a very sophisticated research and education platform, was designed with, in, with input from the fishing community as well, because we want to be able to use this boat to continue to do some of the dredge and trawl sampling we were doing, again, with input from the fishing community. So that's a really good example of just a broad approach to engaging not only uh, the scientific capacity of fishermen, but also that community engagement. And that's really important to get fishermen to be stewards of nursery habitat for species like winter flounder. Um, and really, really, really important. Well, I'm going to switch gears sort of literally and figuratively here to another case study. Um, so we've talked a little bit about habitat and how we study fish and shellfish habitat. Here's a little bit more applied work where we're looking at the sea scallop fishery. And the way sea scallops are harvested is by towing a dredge along the seafloor. Um, I'll show you a picture of that dredge in a minute. And it scoops up sea scallops and a lot of other organisms that may be on the seafloor. Um, and as it drags along the seafloor, it can also in encounter and harvest um, unwanted catch, what's called bycatch. And if you look at the bottom right, um, that is a yellowtail flounder. And as you can see, yellowtail flounder, uh, one of their primary defenses from predators is camouflage. They blend in really well with their surroundings. And that's great if you're trying to hide from a visual predator. You know, these animals really don't move until you get very close to them. And in fact, um, they don't really move until you touch them. And that's going to become important later. Um, unfortunately, if you're a yellowtail flounder and you're trying to hide from a dredge, it doesn't matter whether the dredge can see you or not or how well you're camouflaged. If you're lying in place and that dredge is coming along to scoop up sea scallops, it's also going to scoop you up if you're a yellowtail flounder. And so fishermen really need an individualized approach um, to be able to, if they're encountering a large number of yellowtail flounder, um, 
they may not be able to keep them. There are a lot of prohibitions on keeping protected species or species that are at low abundance in the case of yellowtail. Um, so at some point, they might catch so many yellowtail that they may not be able to continue fishing for scallops. So they need a way to be able to make a decision and have a tool that they could use to not catch as many yellowtail flounder if they so desire. So again, this is another situation where we're engaging local fishermen. And in this case, the fishermen approached us with an idea. Um, Bo Gribben, a fisherman from Provincetown, um, had spent a lot of time underwater diving with his uncle. And the two of them came up with this idea based on their observations that yellowtail flounder don't get out of the way until you touch them, that we could modify a scallop dredge by putting chains on the front of it. And this is a principle that's used for actually catching those same kind of fish. You put a chain sweep on the front of a net um, and uh, particularly uh, on the sides of the net and that will actually herd the fish into the mouth of the net. So they wanted to use that same principle to keep fish from going into the dredge. So the idea is that you hang these chains from the front of the dredge and you can see that medieval looking setup there at the bottom right. That was our first iteration of what ended up being called the tickle dredge for those tickler chains on the front of the dredge. Um, and we built this in Bo's driveway and then we went out and tested it. And in order to test it, we assembled a team of people, um, fishermen, scientists, and we had uh, scientists from the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries um, who had a whole lot of underwater camera gear. And we, what we were able to do is take that camera gear, hook it onto the dredge, both onto the dredge itself and the tow cable that tows the dredge along the seafloor. And we were able to actually use that to view the dredge as it was fishing, to judge the effects of the modifications of the gear, making sure it was getting good bottom contact and that it was fishing appropriately to get some qualitative information on fish behavior. And that's really all well and good. It's really great to get imagery from the seafloor. And it certainly did inform the work that we were doing. On the left there, you can see this uh, sort of a zip line type system where we have a, a bracket on pulleys that you can lower the camera down underwater so it can view the dredge from above. Um, that's a, you can see the an example of what that video looks like from the, from the zip line, uh, the camera trolley rig there. So that's the dredge towing along the seafloor. And that's a real time feed up to the wheelhouse. We were watching that live. And one of the cool things about that, one of the powerful things about that from a, from a learning perspective is that the fishermen had never seen this before. The scientists had never seen this before. You know, we had never really gotten a chance to see this gear fish in real time like that. And it was really cool because we were all on equal footing when we were doing the work. And it was made for some really sort of hilarity in the wheelhouse because you had, you know, probably a century of combined experience in the scallop fishery between the scientists and fishermen. And, you know, none of us had ever seen this and we were, you know, shoving each other out of the way so we could watch the video in real time because it was something that was just so cool and so exciting. And again, because it created a shared learning experience and really putting us on equal footing when we're discovering and learning something together. That was the best part of that video. It was really useful and informative for doing science, um, you know, and it really taught us a lot about how the gear was performing as well, but it was a really powerful tool for more than just doing science. Um, one of the few graphs that I'll put in this slide, um, this one shows that unfortunately our modification to the gear after we did over a hundred toes, um, we couldn't detect a difference. It actually didn't work, ironically enough, um, despite all of the hard work that went into it. And you know, if you had a couple of academics just go to the fisher and say, hey, this, didn't, this isn't gonna work, or we tested this in our laboratory, this isn't gonna work, you know, the fisherman might not have bought it, but not only were the fishermen involved in the research, but I could show them these graphs. They knew how we got this data and they understood why it didn't work. Um, they believed it, they believed the results. So what do you gain from that? Um, you know, and I would argue that you gain a lot even from a failed experiment. You know, again, seeing how science works, even when it fails, um, the transparency that comes with communicating those results and even those failures. Um, expanded engagement. We had fishermen radioing into the fishermen that we were working with and asking questions about the work that we were doing and providing advice. You sort of had, uh, you know, in science, we have peer review um, from other scientists. In this case, the fishermen were giving each other peer review over their VHF radio. Um, and out of that did come some future collaborations as well. So, you know, not all was lost, even though it was arguably a failed experiment. 
One last case study here, and I'm, I'm being conscious of the time and mindful of the fact that uh, we'll have hopefully a lot of questions. Um, but in the meantime, I want to give you one more case study. Um, and that is, this is a kind of a contentious thing that was happening um, in our local community off of Provincetown. Another dredge fishery, uh, in this case, one targeting surf clams. And these surf clams are harvested by towing dredges along the seafloor again. But in this case, those dredges include, um, they're, they're hydraulic dredges, and they include a high pressure uh, uh, set of water jets that are part of the dredge that stir up the seafloor, that essentially liquefy the sand temporarily, fluidize the sand on the seafloor, and uh, make it easier for the clams and whatever else might be in the seafloor to go into that dredge. And so we had an issue where there were a number of uh, fishing vessels operating in a near shore area, very visible to the public off of Provincetown, Massachusetts. And this got a lot of attention from a lot of different people, including the local conservation commission. And they looked at this and said, well, geez, in the state of Massachusetts, you need a permit under the state wetlands act if you're gonna be dredging within a certain distance of shore and so forth. So through a, a sort of unique regulatory framework that's not normally part of fisheries management, um, they sought to actually get an injunction and get this fishing stock temporarily. And that made for a whole complicated natural resource management conflict that's not, uh, not something I can get into today, but it was quite contentious. And while all of this was happening, you had a high level of fishing activity that, that was then immediately curtailed due to this regulatory action. At the same time, very serendipitously, our geology department, and particularly our seafloor mapping group at the Center for Coastal Studies, was doing a high resolution map of the seafloor in that area, collecting side scan sonar data and benthic samples of the organisms living in the seafloor. And that gave us sort of serendipitously at first a very unique sort of before and then after picture of what was going on on the seafloor. Uh, we were actually able to see the tracks made by these dredges on our sonar equipment and plot them out. Um, so on the left hand side, that's a side scan sonar image showing the tracks made by those dredges along the seafloor. To the right is a digitized map. If you look carefully, there are all of these little white lines. Those are those dredge tracks shown um, off of the coast of Provincetown on the side scan sonar data. And so we were able to look at the recovery of the seafloor from those dredge tracks over time. And one of the things we also wanted to do is do a really rigorous study of benthic habitat recovery, you know, taking uh, samples of the benthic invertebrates that lived on the seafloor both before and after the study and look at the benthic community recovery over time. This is one of the metrics that's often used. When I say benthic, I mean the small organisms that live in the seafloor, um, worms and so forth. And so we want to look at the species community recovery over time and do a really good study of the impact of this type of dredge fishing on the seafloor. Now this is something that can potentially really affect the livelihoods of the fishermen that do this kind of work. So we worked with a variety of stakeholders and management agencies and the fishing community. We brought in a, a, a fisherman who worked uh, out of Wellfleet um, who's engaged in this hydraulic dredge fishery and he you know, felt very strongly that you know, the way he fishes with that gear doesn't make an impact. And he wanted to be part of the science to see how we were gonna test this firsthand and be part of the process all the way through. So we partnered up with him, we put cameras on his gear, we set up a survey, we worked in a series of, of uh, transects uh, in areas that had been previously disturbed and that hadn't, and started a sampling process to monitor the benthic recovery over time. And we've had the fisherman and his crew in the lab to see the sonar data, to see the invertebrates in the jars and see how they're analyzed. And again, making sure that process is transparent throughout. And that's really, really important. And you know, again, this is a fisherman that may not like the outcome of the study, but he'll believe it. And that's really, really important. Um, also, just as an aside, you know, when you think of sort of uptake of information and technology, um, some of these fishermen actually went out and got a sort of off the shelf commercial grade side scan sonar that they could use to actually look at the seafloor and monitor their own effects on the benthic habitat. Um, so, you know, sort of uptake of that technology themselves. So more to that story, um, but again, a really cool sort of continued engagement with the fishing community. I wanna spend just a few more minutes. Uh, those are sort of three very different case studies with different management questions. Um, I wanna talk a little bit just about one recent project and then I'll uh, kind of close with some takeaways here. 
Um, this past spring, we spent an enormous amount of time on what has been, I'm not sure how many years we've been doing this work anymore, um, but working with derelict fishing gear and marine debris in the ocean. Now derelict fishing gear is when fishing gear that um, fishermen put into the ocean gets lost, it doesn't get taken back out of the ocean. This is accidental, um, you know, fishermen spend an enormous amount of money on their gear, so they don't willfully discard their gear as a rule. Um, but a lot of times due to boating activity, storms, whatever it might be, conflicts with other fishing gear, fishing gear gets lost on the seafloor. Now it's made of metal and plastic in many cases. You know, plastics in the ocean, of course, a big problem. Fishing gear in general, when it's lost to the seafloor, sometimes can keep fishing and keep catching animals. They become sort of self-baiting when lobsters and fish go into lobster traps and eventually die. And then other things come in and eat those things and so forth. So they can have a, a significant negative impact. Um, gill nets and other lost gear can continue to entangle and catch animals on the seafloor. So we work with the fishing community to identify areas where that gear gets lost and we go out and try to help them find it. And again, we use side scan sonar as one of the tools after we've contacted fishermen in the fishing community and gotten some general information on where we might find the gear, we go out and we survey the bottom. We get side scan sonar imagery, working often from fishing vessels using our sonars, and we can identify on the bottom where all of these lost traps are. And we can map it out. Here again, is, uh, we're off the coast of Provincetown down in Cape Cod Bay again. Every one of those red dots on that sonar display are where we found a target of interest, um, usually a boxy looking target that is likely a lost lobster trap. And this is an area where a lot of gear gets lost because it's a productive habitat for lobsters, but it's also an area where there's a lot of boat traffic. And so lobster traps are generally marked with buoys at the surface. And if those buoys get cut off by a moving boat, a lot of times it's difficult for the fishermen to find their gear. There's other reasons why that gear gets lost, but that's one of the more common ones. So we go out and work with the fishermen to locate this gear. And then we go out and help them find it and, and work to grapple it back up. So this is pretty typical of a grappling operation. This is a fishing vessel out of Provincetown Harbor, a lobster boat. It's towing a grappling hook along the seafloor. And if you look um, on the right hand side at the bottom right, you can see what the grappling hook looks like. You can see above it what our dredge tracks look like as we tow that, dr that grappling hook along the seafloor. And we're gathering up lost lobster traps, other types of gear that are lost on the seafloor. And we're collecting an enormous amount of information from that gear. You can see we get a pretty good load of it sometimes. Here's a pretty big stack of, of derelict lobster traps that were recovered from Cape Cod Bay. And we have scientists out on the boat, like myself, who are collecting a lot of information about how old that trap might be based on the tags that are on it, how filled it is with marine life, how covered it is with marine life. And at some point, these traps make a transition from being actively fishing gear to essentially being habitat as they start to disintegrate and fall apart and be covered with animals, they become uh, much more of a habitat and maybe not quite as worth recovering um, for a variety of different reasons as they might be if they're fresh, new, and still actively fishing. Um, even though they're lost, they're still catching. And they might also be worth something. You know, this time, this time, um, you know, about a month ago, we were bringing back lobster traps that were in still fishable condition and actually putting money back in fishermen's pockets. So in a sort of added bonus of doing this kind of work. And I chose this case study um, in a little bit different context than the other ones because it's kind of a fun project. You know, it's very interactive. It's very hands-on. The fishermen feel really good about doing the work. The community feels good about being a part of it. We're literally cleaning up the ocean. It's, and in many cases, we're really helping fishermen as well. It's also an opportunity to have a little bit of fun. You know, some of this kind of work, um, you know, you can't take yourself too seriously. And again, when I talk to my students about how to engage fishermen, you know, you, you don't try not to take yourself too seriously. Um, we find a lot of unique things when you tow a grappling hook along the seafloor. In this case, um, an old toilet we found, makes for some great photo opportunities and a few laughs. You know, we try to keep a smile on our face when we're out there. Uh, I'm not really sure what Louis, uh, what uh, Willie was doing here with these jumper cables, but again, you know, trying to have a little bit of fun, keep a light heart. Um, this was last Easter, working on a boat out of Sandwich in Cape Cod Bay. I dressed up as the Easter Bunny to get a few laughs because one of the few good weather days we had was on uh, Easter Sunday. 
Um, and so we try to try to have a laugh and keep a smile on our faces as well. You know, that's really important for that building community and building trust part. Um, a couple of other little take homes here before we uh, wind up and open it up to questions. Um, you know, fishermen really become citizen science, scientists. And, you know, you hear a lot about this. You know, I know many folks who are part of the Shoals Marine Lab community would consider themselves citizen scientists. You know, and fishermen are so uniquely positioned to collect really interesting observations. You know, fishermen are literally on sort of the front lines of ecosystem change and climate change. When something unusual is in the ocean, it's usually the fishermen that see it first and record it first. And so, you know, and again, this comes back to that sort of being available and being out there, being present in the community. But fishermen text me at all hours of the day and night um, with weird things they find in the fishing gear. That's a photograph of a, a fish called a short big eye at left that showed up in a fisherman's lobster gear. On the right hand side, um, that's a fish called an Atlantic sorry. I was uh, sitting at a coffee shop having a conversation with someone when somebody literally plopped that wet paper towel and fish in it down in front of me as I was talking to someone and said, hey, what's this? Um, and that was kind of an unusual sighting of these fish in the area. Um, so if you create that venue, create that opportunity, create that dialogue, you know, it really goes a long way. Um, you know, and these are again, where fishermen feel empowered and feel like they're giving information that's really useful and interesting to the community. And it's fun too, you know, it's fun to have that interaction, to, to solve a mystery, to figure out what something is. Um, we had a big influx of short fin squid a couple of years ago. And again, it was the fishermen that were reporting those the first time they were there, both commercial and recreational fishermen. And I think, you know, I'm going to close with a couple of words here about the role fishermen play and scientists play in sort of education and kind of training the next generation. And there's a couple sort of powerful photographs here. Um, one of them at the left is a commercial fisherman out of Chatham, who again operates our, our uh, research vessels sometimes in addition to being a fisherman. What he's doing here is he's showing one of my interns, who's also actually a UNH and Shoals alumnus, um, how to mend a net. You know, that's something uh, Tim didn't learn at school. Maybe, maybe if he took my class at Shoals way back then, he would have learned it. But um, he, uh, you know, something he didn't learn in, in school, um, but it's something that he was able to learn uh, through the collaboration that we had with the fishing community. Um, and then to the right, that's uh, uh, Eric Rigo, a fisherman that I've known since he was uh, in high school. Um, he now uh, often fishes from his own boat, um, in addition to fishing with other commercial fishermen. And, you know, I remember interacting with him when he was a kid doing squid dissections. And he's a young, gener you know, young fisherman, the youngest generation of fishermen that's now armed with an enormous amount of knowledge about management and science that's been gotten in part through our collaborations. And so when he has a question about a natural resource issue or a science question in general, or if he just finds something weird, he reaches out to us and engages with us. And he knows we're here and we're listening and we're willing to engage. Um, and we learn a lot from him too. And we value his knowledge and his perspective. And so again, just the value of these relationships for tra training the next generation. And, you know, with that, I'll, I'll, uh, put in a, a, a plug. Unfortunately, we had to cancel this course this year, but, um, as uh, Jen mentioned at the beginning, you know, uh, Shoals offers a really unique course. Uh, it's taught by myself and uh, Lindsay Williams, another UNH alumnus. Um, she did her PhD work at UNH, and it's a two-week course, one of many great undergraduate courses that Shoals offers. And what's really unique and special about this course, and something that we valued enough to unfortunately cancel it this year so we could do it right next year, is the opportunity that it gives students to interact directly with fishermen. And it's a really, really powerful tool. Um, you know, it's a powerful way to communicate and educate and learn in a community environment. Um, you know, in that, you know, a lot of times the things that the students remember the most about that course is the opportunity that they had to really engage with fishermen and to ask questions, to learn from them. You know, and it's interesting because some of the students have gone on to work with those fishermen in different capacities, uh, whether it be, you know, a day or two as crew to see what it was like or to work on, uh, on the sustainable seafood, seafood supply chain side of things. Um, but it's really cool to, to hear that in many cases, the students and the fishermen stay in touch and start building their own relationships as the students go on in their careers and their education. And, you know, the fishermen learn from, from being part of that process too. 
and um, the fishermen get to be teachers and professors for a day, which is really, really cool. Um, and, you know, a lot of the fishermen we work with are really good at that and they really enjoy that. And again, it gives, gives another voice to people that often don't always have a voice in that culture, in the academic culture. And that's really important. Um, you know, another thing that we do kind of related to that is, you know, we make sure that if fishermen contribute in an academic capacity, in a scientific capacity to the research, that they're acknowledged as co-authors. And a lot of our scientific papers that go out into the peer-reviewed scientific literature include fishermen as co-authors. Um, you know, if they've made all of those contributions, kind of coming up with a hypothesis, collecting the data, helping us interpret the data, editing the manuscript with us, you know, those are all criteria for scientific authorship. And we, we adhere to those when it comes to involving the fishermen as well. Um, and again, you know, we do a lot of communication. We try to get the word out on the work that we're doing in as many different ways as we can from social media to, you know, the public media and so forth. You know, constantly trying to get the word out about what we're doing. And this is another great venue to do that. So I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you folks about the work that we're doing. I'll close here and uh, hopefully we'll have some time for questions. Um, you know, I do want to say, you know, fishermen and scientists sometimes see things with very different lenses, very different perspectives. And what it comes down to, I've, I've found a lot of times, is that we see things at different scales a lot of times, scales of space and time. And, you know, whether we're looking at a global climate model or whether we're looking at what's happening in the same piece of ocean every single day, as one does if you're a commercial fisherman, you know, sometimes it can lead to very different perceptions of what's going on out there, very different perspectives. But quite often we're looking at the same pieces of the puzzle just at a different scale in space or in time. And when we learn to talk to each other and speak the same language, we can really do some good science, but also we can come to a much better common understanding of what's going on in the ocean and of one another as scientific and fishing communities. So it's, it's really powerful work. It's something that I hope you can tell I love doing um, and, you know, it's something that, you know, we always hope is benefiting the community in the long run. So I think with that, um, I'll, I'll turn it back to, uh, Jen and the Shoals folks here to, uh, moderate some question and answers and however that's going to work, but I'm here standing by. Owen, that was amazing. Thank you so much. I mean, you just laid out beautifully the, the benefits of the collaboration the, the opportunity for collaboration between scientists and the fishermen, the users, the resource users. So that was fabulous. So we do have some questions coming in on the Q&A. So if you have a question, this is your time, please type it on the Q&A and I will read them out loud and um, Owen will We'll give it a shot. So Jonathan was really curious about the last slide that you had on case study one had a had a histogram graph there and he really wanted to know what you what that was about. Well, hi Jonathan. Um, so that that uh, that graph was showing uh, I believe it was winter flounder catch um, by month. Uh, pretty sure that's what it was. Um, over, over the, the year long survey that we did. Um, that's fairly typical of what the data look like when we do that. And sometimes we normal it by unit of effort, which uh, normalize it by unit of effort. So like catch per, per tow or for you know, time spent trawling or whatever your index of fishing effort is. But that's what that was. It's one of a hundred graphs in that report and I'll, I'll gladly send you the report if you like. I, I, I know how to get to you. Cal Weeks, uh, Shoals legend and uh, fisheries scientist as well. He wrote excellent talk, insightful case studies, which I definitely echo with your opinion there, Hal. He says, thank you. Uh, on slide 13, in the living room scene, was that Seth Masinko of Yukon? You know, uh, yes. Connecticut. Yeah, Seth's at uh, URI, but um, or he was then anyway. Um, but yeah, that, that indeed was. Um, he's a he's a friend and collaborator uh, with the fishermen that I work with, and very much engaged in the the seafood community, the sustainable seafood community, and looking at supply chains and um, sort of uh, a lot of social science issues associated with uh, fishery science and management. And uh, yeah, he was with us at the conference, and uh, he enjoyed a few libations with us as well. <laughs> Morgan wants to know, is it true that uh, officials have recently reevaluated the Sea Scout fishery? Is that true? And 
if it is, then why the hiatus? Um, well, what are, there's, there's, you know, fisheries like the sea scallop fishery are in a constant state of evaluation. My guess is what that's referring to is there was a, um, and feel free to, to add a, another question or a clarification, but um, I believe that there, the, the fishery in the northern Gulf of Maine was closed for a while. Um, and we, sea scallops are managed in a rotational way. So it's one of the better managed fisheries in the sense that we, um, you know, when I say we, I mean the broader scientific community, um, do surveys often in collaboration with the fishing industry and they get really good information about what the sea scallop stock is like on the seafloor and they can actually set quotas in specific areas or set catch limits in specific areas based on pretty good abundance estimates, which we don't always have in fisheries. Um, and when an area um, has a, a set quota or set abundance uh, associated with it, the set number of scallops you can take out essentially once that number starts to be reached, that area is closed temporarily to give the population time to rebound, then it gets opened again. It's rotational management. Um, I, I hope that makes sense and I may not be speaking about the correct change, but I do know that the Gulf of Maine area was recently closed in the northern Gulf and that's part of that rotational management. Yeah, Morgan, if you have a follow-up question, you can put it in the Q&A. So from Jackie Webb, who's a Shoals alum and URI a marine scientist, she says, I live near Port Judith, Rhode Island, and only after COVID hit did we get a chance to buy fish directly from the fishermen. Do you think this practice has benefited the fishermen, and do you think it will continue after COVID is long gone? She hopes so. Yeah, that's a great question. I've had a lot of conversations um, with with the fishing community, you know, both here and actually down in Rhode Island as well. And I, you know, I think the fishermen are cautiously optimistic as well that this is a positive thing all the way around. You know, right now, you know, fishermen are seeing in some cases a slightly better price um, for their fish, or at least an equal price, and still having a market because the, you know, at least where we are, the restaurants have been closed for a while, so the market really went down. Um, but people needed ways to get seafood and get fresh seafood. Um, and so they, uh, many uh, fishermen were very creative in how they reached out and how they marketed their seafood. The states really helped out. This is an important piece of it where the states actually set up a way for fishermen to get a permit to sell directly to the consumer. Um, and that's a big part of that as well. You know, shortening that supply chain. You know, a lot of times out on the Cape here, our fish get caught go up to a market in Boston or New York and then come back to the Cape. And, you know, that's inefficient in a lot of ways. Um, and it creates, in many cases, a higher price for the consumer and a lower price for the fishermen overall. So direct marketing in many ways is good for the fishery. It's not the perfect solution because you don't have the volume that, you know, large markets and chains and restaurants need, but it's another way for fishermen to sell their product in many cases, turn a better profit. Although in many cases, it's also a bit more work. Um, but it's really important from a sustainability side because like, and I alluded to this earlier, you know, I think it creates those conversations. You know, I was down the dock doing a, a sea scallop pickup from our local fishermen through one of these direct programs. And I heard a woman who had no idea, idea how scallops were caught asking the fishermen about that dredge that was on the deck of his boat and asking how it worked. And I think, you know, those sort of little subtle sort of almost intangibles are among the things that are going to create, uh, you know, a really good sustainable future for our fisheries because people are asking the right questions and, you know, I think that's really powerful. But hopefully it is a good thing. And I think fishermen, in many cases, hope it will last in, in that regard anyway. Marissa, also a Shoals alum, she thanks you for this great talk. And she asks, for the derelict fishing gear study, did you also include gear that washes up on the beaches? Yeah, we did. We did do some beach cleanups as well. Um, and we, ha we have a lot of volunteers doing that. Um, and we bring the, the debris back and catalog it the same way. So if we can uh, associate it with um, a, a fishery, we do that to try to understand, you know, how it correlates with uh, fishing activity in the area. So yeah, we do. We do beach cleanups. We do those anyway, but we, we make sure to catalog and document the fishing gear as well. Uh, here's another question from April, April Blakesley, another Scholler. Um, for the second case study, are there new ideas in the works for refining the bycatch reduction after the results of your study? Yeah, so we did, we did come up with some other ideas about how we might, you know, continue with that sort of bottom contact idea. What we figured was based on the way the dredge was performing and, you know, the more we learn about fish behavior is that that 
tactile stimulus, that chain contacting the bottom was just too close to the dredge and it wasn't giving the fish time to react. So we have some other ideas about how we might modify the gear, modify the toe line in particular with an apparatus that we might be able to sort of tickle the bottom further ahead of that dredge. Um, so that's one example of how we might go about doing that. So yeah, there's, there's some other ideas in the works as well. And I don't want to share the fisherman's proprietary knowledge too much, but that's something we've talked about widely. So. Uh, Carrie, who's a Shoals alum and scientist, is um, thanking you for an awesome talk and the work that you're doing. And in reference to the clam dredging study, what was the time scale for invertebrate community recovery, assuming they recovered, and how did or will these data get incorporated into decision making by the resource agencies? Great questions. Um, we're still counting bugs. Um, so the, the short answer is I don't know. I don't have a good answer for community recovery um, because it takes an enormous amount of time. And I imagine uh, some of you know this, but it takes an enormous amount of time to process those invertebrate samples. Um, so we're still working on those samples, even though the, the, the last of them were collected uh, over a year ago. Um, so it takes an enormous amount of time to pick through each one of the grab samples that are taken and you know, pull out and identify all of those invertebrates. And we have an army of volunteers and students working on it, but there's still more to do. So stay tuned on that. As far as how the, the information gets taken up by management, um, you know, that's a great question, you know, and we have different people look or different management bodies looking at it with different lenses, you know, the park service, some of it falls in within a national park, which is another interesting thing, um, is looking at it one way. Um, the State Division of Marine Fisheries may be looking at it with a different lens. The New England Fishery Management Council, again, yet another management body, they all have kind of different criteria and some of them are fairly, you know, um, a bit arbitrary in terms of how they evaluate impact. So, you know, we've tried to work within the frameworks that they've given us to at least give some quantitative data, but ultimately it's going to be up to the managers to say, okay, well, you know, invertebrate community changed over, you know, however many months or years time, and it took this amount of months or years to recover. So what, what does that mean? You know, and unfortunately that's sort of out of our wheelhouse, um, so to speak, um, as far as how to interpret that. And that's one of those instances where we hope the information that goes to the managers is useful, but in a lot of, and this is one where we're not necessarily getting the best guidance from managers about what they want. Um, you know, I don't know if any of them are listening today. I mean, I, either I hope they are or not, because I don't mean to be disparaging, but you know, they, they may not necessarily know what the question is to ask either. Sometimes it's kind of an iterative thing, but you know, we're using the tools that we know how to use as best we can to answer their questions. All right, that looks like all the questions, unless somebody wants to grab this moment. Owen, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. And really, I want to pile on with Carrie's comment. Thank you so much for the work that you do, because the, the collaboration and the understanding and building trust and relationships between scientists and the end user, like the fishermen in this example, is just such great, important work. So thank you. And also for teaching sustainable fisheries at the lab. Well, it's been, been my pleasure to join you. It's been my pleasure to teach at Shoals. I'm looking forward to coming back there. Um, and it's great to hear from so many uh, Shoals alumni and uh, some Shoals faculty in there too. So uh, great to hear from you. And uh, yeah, I, you know, I look forward to, to checking out some of the other uh, Rock Talks online. I think you guys are doing an amazing job carrying on a virtual presence from the, from the Isles of Shoals. Um, so, you know, keep on keeping on and thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Owen. So I just wanted to tell everyone that we are recording all of these talks and we'll post them to the Shoals live stream page on our webpage, shoalsmarinelaboratory.org. Um, please feel free to share these with whoever, your friends, family. We have two talks coming up next week on World Oceans Day. I'm going to give a talk about seabirds. It's a talk that will focus on hope. So that's June 8th at 12 p.m. There's information on our website about that. Our next Rock Talk, which is next Tuesday, um, June 9th at 7.30 is Dr. Aaron Rice. He's a principal ecologist at the Center for Conservation Bioacoustics at Cornell's Lab of Ornithology. His talk is Calling Whales and Chorusing Fishes as Sentinels of Human Influence on Marine Ecosystems. All of this these, both these talks and more information about all the things happening this summer, we are bringing way more 
off online and off island than we ever have before. All of it's on our website, shoalsmarinelaboratory.org. Thank you all so much for joining us. Take care and hope to see you here again next week. Bye-bye.